All right. Well, good uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome very much to everyone that's attending live to this webinar Wednesdays with Cadence PCB. It's a pleasure to see so many people attending this webinar live. Thank you for taking this specific time out of your day to make the live event special. Also, thank you to all of those that are viewing this archive of the event at a later time. This series of webinars highlights the latest in Cadence PCB 17.2 uh, 2016 technology that can help you and your team improve your design while improving your time to market. Today's event will be conducted by myself, Jim Fry, and Ed Hickey. We welcome your participation in this event as well as in the future events coming, coming soon. These webinars will be recorded and available on demand for you to share with your teammates. The webinars today are a series, and our first one today is the Accelerate Your PCB Designs. In the future, we'll have others that you see on this list that will highlight various elements of Cadence PCB, Allegro, and ORCAD, as well as up-to-date technologies to make sure that you feel that you're with us in the future as we move this product forward to help you better. So for today's event, uh, we have Ed Hickey, who's our currently our product engineering director. Uh, he's based in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, where he's responsible for the technical content of the Allegro PCB editor. He's been at Cadence for 16 years, and prior to that, he worked at Data General for 11 years as a PCB designer and manager. Today's session will be pretty fast. We have this uh, short introduction. We'll have a quick poll to make sure everyone on the call is paying attention and then we'll have our 45 minutes or so of, of technical content with Ed and then during this content we welcome your participation by adding your questions into the question window uh, in the webinar dashboard that you see on your right and then we'll have a wrap up with the questions and uh, look forward to you participating in future events. Next slide. So for this specific episode, we're working to provide a, a general introduction to the Cadence PCB Tools version 17.2 2016. And this improvement set has been a combination of customer inputs and market drivers to make this tool more up to date along the path of accelerating your designs, improving your design quality, minimizing respins and in general making your designs better. We're uh, happy that this is a, the initial event of many series and in this case the technology will apply quite often to Allegro and ORCAD so we'll take note of that when we can. And after watching this webinar and these others in the series we're happy to uh, Make sure that you feel comfortable about the value of the 17.2 release, uh, that it is right for you and your team, and we welcome your feedback on the topic. And at this point, I'd like to welcome Ed Hickey uh, to start his presentation. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody. A special thanks to our beta team uh, through 17.0 and 17.2, helping us to define uh, features as well as testing them. My name is Ed Hickey. I will be going over the top 10 reasons to migrate to 17.2. I'm gonna begin with the PadStack editor overhaul. If you have not performed your evaluation yet, this is where I suggest you begin. Okay, first we have introduced a new modern user interface supporting a left to right data flow across the top tabs. I'll be getting into that more in a minute. It is a single cockpit for through hole and SMD pad creation with access to both the shape symbol editor and the flash symbol editor. Okay, now I'm in the start, the start tab. This is the first step in the pad creation process. We have introduced five new uh, attributes 
uh, bond finger, die pad, tooling hole, mounting hole, fiducial. Uh, the bottom three align with the 2581 schema. These essentially are attributes that we can key on with browsers as well as uh, being able to pass them to manufacturing so that the readers can actually process them correctly. In the lower section of the first form, we, have, we introduce new pad primitives or new geometries. Okay, we introduce the rounded rectangle, the chamfered rectangle, and variations of above. And what I mean by that is we have corner controls to allow you to, to basically create a tombstone from a rounded rectangle or a home plate uh, from a chamfered rectangle. We introduce the donut pad. And this uh, is the first Allegro pad that supports what we call a touch interconnect model. So you'll be able to route to any section of this donut uh, outer ring. Now the benefits would be uh, if you are currently drawing shape-based pads today, this will allow you now to use these primitives, cutting down the time of entry dramatically. The next tab would be the drill tab. We introduced the new actual drill size. This is the size of the drill before plating. This is a free text field allowing you to type in the diameter or the actual tool number. The 16.6 drill diameter field migrates up to the finish diameter field. Okay. This drill tool size is optional. We suggest that you maybe think about using it for press fit connectors or any type of hole where, where the manufacturer requires you to define that hole size to be passed to the fabricator. So this might save you a note or two on the fab drawings. The third tab, secondary drill types, we introduce the back drill, diameter, figure, character, and I'll get more into back drill uh, later in this presentation and then more a deeper dive in an upcoming webinar. The counterbore, which supports diameter and depth. The countersink, which supports diameter and angle. Design layer entry tab. This would be the fifth one over to the right. This is where you do most of your work, defining the begin, the end, the internal, the regular pad, the thermal and anti-pads. What's new here is the keep out geometry. This would be the last column. Uh, this would be uh, basically a transition from 16.6 where we had the previously defined ARK pad option. This allowed you to use anti-pads as keep outs on mechanical pins. So now this geometry stored in the pad definition can be used on any type of, of pin, not just mechanical. Examples that you might want to consider would be the, the middle layer of a skip via, or of course, mounting and tooling holes. Adjacent layer route keepouts. You may have had instructions from signal integrity engineers to add keepouts under surface mount pads. Uh, this is a keepout now that you can add uh, beyond the begin end layers of the pad definition. The process would be the librarian would define the geometry of this keep out in the pad editor, and the PCB designer would define the range, how, how deep you want to go under the pad in Allegro. Uh, that this is done using properties. These are the two properties here, adjacent layer keep out above and below, and we support a max range from one to eight layers. Solder masks can now be fragmented to support examples like the window pane uh, mask scheme that you see in view or the, the pad used for a microphone down below. Um, the, these mask, mask pads in general can be .SSM or .FSM. It is only the FSM that supports the multiple elements. Uh, my last note uh, with respect to the pad uh, session here would be this. Uh, plan your, your 17.2 migration with the pad stack changes in mind, okay, as down rev to 16.6 is not possible for the pad file or the .brd file. Um, you may want to consider supporting two libraries, both a 16.6 and a 17.2 library as, as you make your way into 17.2, then maybe abandon 16.6. Some customers uh, will just go right to 17.2 and, and not look back. So this is one of the things you really need to consider. Okay. Reason number two would be the overhaul of the cross-section editor. Okay. As we did with the pad editor, we are overhauling uh, some uh, legacy forms in Allegro. This now has the, the look and feel of the constraint manager um, user interface. Uh, the big ticket items would be the uh, definition of multiple stackups to support uh, rigid flex applications and um, applications known as inlay, where we have digital boards with small sections of RF material inserted. 
Uh, second would be the definition of non-conductor layers. This applies to both standard rigid boards as well as flex. You have the ability to add solder mass, solder paste, cover lay, adhesive stiffness above top, below bottom. And we'll get more into that coming up. Okay, some of the uh, other features with the cross-section editor. Over on the right side of the user interface, we have a bitmap defining uh, the layers and the drilling intent. This is similar to what you might see in a, in a physical C-set, but the drilling here is actual drills used in a database. Uh, it's now possible if you're doing <clears throat> HDI design, maybe ELIC technology, you could hover over one of these drill symbols and actually perform a reverse drill direction to align with the, how the drilling might occur at the fabricator. Uh, this, this change will then affect the drill legend. All we, all we do is simply just reverse the order of the layers on this uh, legend. Over on the left here, um, in 16.6, you have one tolerance field for thickness. We now have both positive and negative tolerance. If you're using buried and blind vias today and um, accustomed to the labels, we now allow you to customize these labels up to three alphanumeric characters, for example, uh, in 16.6, layer top would, would be represented as one. It's now possible for you to type in the word TOP or L2, etc. Material names currently at a limit of 19 get increased up to 250. Down in the bottom section of the form, we have the info tab lock embedded layer setup unused pad suppression. So we are trying to make the cross section editor somewhat of a single uh, cockpit to manage applications that require uh, a view of the cross-section. Uh, with info, you will see total thickness, total thickness without the mask layers, as well as a breakdown of conductor, plane, and mask layers. The lock control would prevent you from adding layers or, or changing values. It's kind of a safeguard uh, against making mistakes. It's, it's settable by the user. Okay. Reason number three, uh, rigid flex design. This is a, a major ticket item for us in 17.2 and, and well deserving of its own webinar. So I'm going to basically be skimming through some of the, uh, the main features, uh, like the changes we've done in the cross section and zones, uh, the new class subclass structures, auto drop down of compo component placement, uh, our new interlayer rule checker, and improvements with push and sh shove routing. Okay, if you're interested now in actually designing a rigid uh, flex design and taking advantage of the multiple cross-section support, it, it's a very few easy steps. First, you're going to go into the cross-section editor, click the view uh, menu, and go into this mode that we call multi-stack-up mode. This now allows you to either click the cells I have shaded in yellow, add stack-up, or just the plus sign, and this will essentially just add columns to the grid. Okay. Once these call, once you click the add stack up, you're prompted to enter a name for that stack up. In this example, I'm using two additional stack ups. We have a six layer rigid, not uh, filled in with blue, and then we have two sections of two layer flex core and a flex with a stiffener under it. Okay, so this is a reason to create two additional stack ups. We default. The main stack up to primary. Okay, so everyone's going to see primary in the 17.2 cross section. There's no reason to do anything else. There's no reason to create zones for primary. Think of primary as the area of the PCB that doesn't require any type of special zone considerations. It's the default. Next step would be adding in non conductor layers. Okay, and of course, we're going to add in solder mass top, solder mass bottom. This, this first column here, I'm using the tab all stack ups, are all layer possibilities. Okay, this is not a true stack up. This is a collection of all the layers possible that comprise all the different stack ups. So you'll notice that I have cover lay top, cover lay bottom, as well as system, stiffener bottom defined. Okay, these are now the new design defined mask layers. When you're adding in mask layers, you have two choices. You can add them from what we call a new site-defined mask layer file. This is very similar to uh, the materials.dat file, but more modernized. Or you can add them in directly from the database. This can be the current user-defined layers you have set up, 
all the ones now that we have hard coded in Allegro. And this is just the, an example of them. I'm sure you have many more uh, uses for, for the layers that you currently use. So I, I would recommend that you take a hard look uh, at this site defined mass layer file. Uh, we'll go over this in detail in, in the webinar coming up. And, and think about using that to control layer entry. We certainly don't want users you know, typing in layer names and possibilities of making mistakes. Okay. The very last step, we have our mass layers defined, we have our stack ups defined. All we need to do now is configure. So we're gonna go up and down each column of the grid here. With primary, you'll notice that all my electrical layers and dielectric layers are enabled. I'm gonna disable cover lay and keep solder mask enabled. And then with flex, we're just going to enable the flex core layers. Okay, that would be flex one and flex two over here, as well as for edge con. And the difference for edge con versus flex is that I'm enabling the stiffener bottom down here. Okay, the next step in the process would be now that we have stack ups defined, we have to map them to physical zones. Okay, so like I said before, a zone, think of a zone as a deviation from primary. Okay, the six layer rigid is the primary. I don't need to add a zone there. I'm adding zones in one, two, three, four, five, six locations here, okay? Um, the zone uh, requires uh, mapping uh, to the stack up. So we can do this when we add the zones or you can do it through the new zone manager that we have created. A zone is a single contiguous shape, okay? It automatically snaps to the design outline during creation. So this is a very simple process. Once you create that zone, we're gonna generate route keepouts on the etch layers that are not included uh, for that respective stack up. So on this two layer flex, we are adding route keepouts on four etch layers, the top and in one and the bottom and, and bottom minus one. So that's all done for you. Moving on to placement, uh, today when you are moving components from rigid to flex, uh, most likely you are using our embedded component technology to drop the component down to the surface layer, or you may be making edits to pad stacks in place. And, and 17.2 now eliminates these workarounds, and I'm gonna show a, a video in just a second, but as we move uh, these components across the, uh, the boundary, there's no action on your part. We'll automatically drop them down to the top layer of the flex. Okay, we've come up with a brand new DRC engine to check um, mask layer to mask layer geometry or mask layer to surface metal geometry. This is completely configured by the user. On this grid here, you're gonna see a list of layers going down the, the vertical across the horizontal. You're gonna go in here and enable the checkboxes to create the configuration that ultimately results down here in the lower section. Okay? You have the ability to create a, a layer one to layer two kind of configuration with choices of gap, overlap, inside conditions, two inside one, one inside two. So basically this is one, the layers over here, this is two, the layers across the horizontal. Then you have a choice of um, adding in a DRC label code, uh, the DRC subclass that you want us to write this out to, and a description of the DRC. So some examples might be uh, the ability to check uh, against a bend area or a bend line against adjacent metal. And then this would be examples of what we call inside conditions where you want the ge geometry on one subclass to be contained uh, within the geometry of another subclass. Uh, a good example of that would be surface pads to cover lay openings. So I'm gonna switch over just quickly now to a couple of movies to close out uh, the uh, top, the, the, the rigid flex uh, session. This would be an example of me adding a zone where you see the ability to add the stack up at this time. I'm windowing, windowing around the flex area. Once I say done, we'll go over to the visibility tab. I'm gonna pause it for a minute here. Now look at the bottom of this visibility form. I have now added in custom layers to the panel and we'll go over that uh, later on in the webinar, but I'm gonna now turn on the route keep out bottom and the route keep out top, right from the visibility pane. No more trips to the color dialog. This is now moving uh, an SOIC across to the flex. You notice how 
the component pads change color. So we're basically going from the top layer down to flex one, the blue layer, and then I move the component that was mounted on the bottom red, and that gets dropped to the flex yellow. And then I'll end the demo by moving these components back to the rigid, where they now revert back to the top and bottom layers. This is an example of a bend area uh, requiring a gap check to the stiffener on the flex. Okay, I'm configuring the check in the upper section grid. Down below, you see the bend area to stiffener, stiffener flare. <laughs> if I can only talk, stiffener flex check gap defined as 20. Okay, and now what I'm doing here is I'm going to modify the copper, increasing the gap. And this is real time. This is not a, a post DRC. Okay, so next we'll go on to uh, the, uh, the closing of the rigid flex uh, session, and that would be this. We, we, in product engineering, create a lot of material, uh, and, and one of them is a best practice paper that is now available on the Cadence online uh, support website. Uh, we have redesigned this site, and I was able to go on there and find uh, this paper very quickly just by typing in the word rigid flex. Uh, in the search field. We also have authored a, a white paper. Uh, we have a, a great blog area now on the Cadence community site. Uh, Jim has authored the blog on uh, Rigid Flex. Uh, my team, Mike Catterbone, Ed Atchison, Vince Delello will be contributing blogs uh, to this site. And with those blogs uh, come links to videos, uh, as, as well as uh, white papers, and you also can uh, type in comments, and I'm sure that will be prompt in trying to answer them. Okay, reason number four. <clears throat> this feature was introduced back in 16.6, and we have lots of customers using enhanced contour, uh, contour routing to route uh, against the, uh, the contour of a flex, but it's also used in other applications. And what we tried to do here in 17.2 is make it more efficient uh, for you to use. We've eliminated the need to use that right mouse button uh, to choose between uh, the, uh, the route keeping or adjacent to C line. You'll see in the video coming up that all I have to do is, is just kind of start the route and then shift the route and then you'll see the object highlight. Once you see it highlight, all you need to do is make a simple click. And this is why we call it a simple two-state click model. You begin with one click, you end with the second click. So let's, let's go on now and see what we've done here. So notice now this top C line is highlighted. Okay, that's gonna be the C line that I lock onto, right? Once I start the route, look what's happening next. I'm pushing and shoving in the other direction, including the arc. Now, once I make a click at that point, okay, that's how I release the lock and continue the routing, just as we do now in 16.6. Okay, reason number five, uh, via structures. Okay, uh, we have a, a lot of feedback from, from customers as to um, defining a, a via structure uh, on uh, your differential pair transitions. But, but first, I do want to spend a minute talking about what we did in 16.6, because I feel this is not known uh, by everybody, and I, I just want to make sure it is known today uh, with this great audience of over 500 people I hear we have online. Um, so this allows you now, as you're routing a diff pair, to define one of six configurations for return path vias adjacent to the two signal transitions. Okay? Um, the, down below here, I have one of my uh, function key uh, setups you're going to see on the upcoming video that I'm going to be cycling with a function key through each and every one of these. So if you want to grab your, your phone out now or take a screen capture, it might be a good idea just to capture this and, and, and enter it into your ENV file. Or you can email me and I'd be glad to, to send this to you at a later time. Okay, what we've done in 17.2, however, is those get you the return path vias. But one of the more popular requests is we need to define the anti-pad uh, configuration on the plane. So this is what we, we hear about most common, is the need to define an oval keep out on the planes within the signal uh, transitions, okay? And this is what this high-speed via structure function will allow you to do. This allows you now in the database to combine via C-line shapes, route keep outs, into a single 
reusable design element where you can now access this from the database, but also from disk. If, if you remember now in 16.6, we do have VIA structures, but we can't write them out to disk and have them reusable in other databases. Okay? Now we write out the high-speed VIA structure in an XML format. It's available from the route menu via structure, create high speed option. Okay, so this is a, an Allegro PCB editor, high speed product option. What I'm going to do now is a quick uh, demo of the uh, return path via that we've introduced in 16.6. Okay, I'm using my spacebar now to add the via and the first configuration. And then I'm using my F3 uh, key to actually cycle through the uh, six other configurations. Okay, that's simple. And in the setup process, of course, we define the, uh, the ground name on the return path vias. Now I'm pulling via structures out of the database. I have them named sim similar to components, and you can define a via structure with routes or just the, the vias themselves. You can define them as a set of transitions like I have here. I'm in free place mode now. I've defined just the gathering etch only. Okay, and the use model would be place these as components, and then when it's time to route, start here, and then route to your destination pins or vias, and then we assume the logic of, of that connection. Okay. Um, the question you're, you're probably asking right now and writing into my team is, will you uh, integrate this into the add connect command? And the answer is yes. So that, that's coming up. We, we fully intend to do that. Okay, reason number six, uh, this is what we call tab routing. Uh, this is a new uh, routing strategy that adds uh, trapezoidal shapes, uh, or what we call tabs, uh, to parallel traces uh, for the purpose of controlling impedance in the pin field or breakout regions, or controlling crosstalk in the open field reason. Uh, this allows you to uh, add longer trace lengths and also the use of smaller trace spacings. This is the setup. Uh, we have four different styles of tabs as defined by the chip maker. This is not something that we have defined. Uh, the names are interdigital 1 and interdigital 2, pin field line and pin field arc. You're basically going to select your styles, enter your parameters, and then you're simply going to window around the section of routes that you want to add the tabs to. And in a scenario like this, you're probably using one configuration in the array, one configuration in the breakout area, and then one configuration out in open space. Okay, I'll play the next video and just show you how it's done. This is also a high-speed product option and currently a prototype, so you do need to go to the route prototype menu. All right, that's how simple it is to add these tabs. And then I'm jumping ahead here to the open space area where I change the settings and window around those C lines to add a different style of tab. And most likely it's necessary to move them to prevent conflicts. And we do have a move command that allows you to move the tab while it maintains its place on the C line. Next up would be a, um, a various uh, general usability improvements, and uh, I, I, I have very many more to, to go over, but for this webinar, I've selected just a few. And I'm going to stay with the routing theme uh, for a moment. Um, we have had requests over the years now to center routes and channels. I know it's necessary not only for, for manufacturability, but, but also to maintain that route over copper on the adjacent plane. That's your best chance uh, for good return path or impedance control is, is dead center between the channel. So what we have in 17.2 is a uh, kind of a prototype feature that you would have to enable in the user preference editor, unsupported section down here. You would go over to optimize in channel and type in a value that represents the max channel that you want this to work in. Um, once you are in the add connect command, okay, the uh, application will now self-center, or we're, we're going to use the word optimize, but ideally we are trying to center the routes within the channels. So this is an example of um, the legacy routing behavior where we tend to hug uh, the pads, and then with the optimization, 
we would uh, try to center them uh, between uh, the channels. So let me uh, switch back over to the movie and just show you legacy. This is the, the, what you see today when routing. And that's not really where you want the route in the end. And then I'm going to switch over and enable that variable. And now notice the behavior. So why prototype, why unsupported? Um, this gives us a chance to introduce functionality ahead of schedule. Um, if it wasn't for this vehicle, this might not be out now. This might be a 17.4 candidate. So we ask you to, to try it out and try to provide us feedback so we have a chance to, to improve it by the time we productize this. Okay, the visibility pane. We have added a new mode in, in the bottom of this pane that I don't have in view here, but it would be well down below here called uh, layer select mode. Uh, how many times uh, when you're routing are you constantly doing all off, one on in terms of layer control? So when this mode is enabled, you'll see the layer names become this blue hyperlink. Okay? And then when I click on the link, all other layers become uh, disabled and only that layer becomes visible. And I can use the control key to extend the visibility to more than one layer. And it's probably best that I demo this to show you the real intent. Um, what I'm going to do here is down here. Here's the enable layer select mode. All the layers now are in a blue hyperlink. I clicked on top and only the top layer is visible. Next, I'm clicking on layer three. Top gets disabled. Three gets enabled. And the next step would be I'm holding the control key now to select more than one layer. I now have three layers visible, which sometimes is necessary. But next, when I click layer top, all become disabled except top. I, I think this next feature might be the top uh, CCR in our system. Uh, this allows you now to apply dynamic shape properties by layer. Uh, you, most likely, you're looking to control thermal reliefs on a per layer basis. This allows you to go in and use edit property and use any of the properties that begin with DYN and use them in a, a layer situation. So you'll see this grid come up with these property with these layers. Now, if you remember the way we define regions, we allow you to type in. Uh, um, hierarchy in terms of outer, inner, or inner signal controls, but also instance layer controls. So you have the ability now to work at the layer instance level and control your, your thermals right down the line here. We do not have DRCs in place. Um, there's no current plans to do that, but we'll be looking for your feedback in, in this area as well. With shape application mode, this is a very popular feature, a very powerful feature to edit the boundaries of shapes. Uh, the most popular enhancement we have seen in the system is the ability to apply parameters across multiple dynamic shapes at once. We're hearing numbers of more than two, three hundred, five hundred shapes on a board, and sometimes users have to go in there and apply properties across hundreds of shapes. Um, I'm going to show you a way to do this in just a moment. The second feature would be with the add notch command, currently in 16.6. We default it to orthogonal, but in 17.2 now, you can enter in a user-defined angle, and we default it to uh, 135 and 45 in the dropdown. And then if you're using the slide function uh, while moving a boundary of a shape, you can now type in the XY, I mean the IX, IY command in the command window to move it to a, a finite location. Those who are doing crosshat shapes, certainly flex designers, might find it a little cumbersome in 16.6 to go in and add a dynamic crosshat shape that's a bit uh, step related. Uh, today, now in 17.2, we streamline this operation. We have added in a new uh, field in the drop down called dynamic crosshatch. So, this is a one step operation, no different than the adding in a dynamic solid shape. So, just one step, and now you have the cross section added, crosshatch added. This is now a powerful uh, new feature in 17.2. Uh, find by query. This is a relational search engine. 
that we introduced in our EAP 17 overlease. We've worked with several beta customers trying to improve the usability of it. So in 17.2, we relaunch it, a much more modernized uh, user interface, um, which supports now all the design elements over here on the left column with special criteria up here in the left pane. Um, the best way for me to show this is I'm going to put a one-two punch together here, and I'm going to show you how to use this Find by Query engine to select certain dynamic shapes of a certain net name of a certain layer, uh, and then apply uh, uh, parameters to those selected shapes. So let's now go to the movie. And this would be the, the interface for the Find by Query engine. Notice the elements on the left. I'm selecting net and class name in this pane. You see it shift over to the right. I'm now applying the net name VCC to net and I'm applying flex one to the subclass name. I'm selecting the matching object. So we found eight shapes on one layer. So now in Allegro, those shapes are temporarily highlighted. I hover over any one of those shapes, go to the parameter form, make my parameter adjustments, maybe an oversized clearance value, and then apply. That's simple. Okay, with the color dialog, we have a lot of good stuff here. Um, customization is key as a user. You want to be able to customize forms that are too busy, customize the ordering of things. You now have the ability to customize uh, the headers, the, these headers here. Okay, so look at this column here. We have plan, etch, via, pin, DRC. Perhaps you don't want plan. Perhaps you don't use bundles. Or, so you can now remove that and, and, and basically shrink down the elements that you see in this top section here. Um, add layers to the pane. As I, re -mentioned, er as I mentioned earlier, you want to be able to access typical layers that you use frequently, like route keepouts or design outline and so forth, but you're tired of using view schemes or tired of traveling to the color dialog. So you have the ability to simply hover over one of these uh, layer names in the color dialog, then do a right mouse button, add to visibility. So this will add these layers down in this lower section of the color form, and then make them appear in the lower section of the visibility pane. You also have controls to turn off things in the visibility pane. Perhaps you don't want to see uh, certain fields, so that, that would be down here. We have the ability to show mask layers, so no more trips again to the color dialog. If you're doing rigid flex design, you want to be able to, to see all those special mask coding layers above top, below bottom. Uh, certainly your, your manufacturing folks who use the, the free viewer or the paid viewer perhaps might want to see those layers and not have to figure out how to make them visible through some you know steps in the color dialog. Uh, over here on the right, we, we have controls to increase the button sizes and the spacing between them. So you might find uh, these swatches too small, the text too small. So we have a way of increasing um, that in 17.2. Um, let's move on now to Backdrill. Backdrill is a, is a feature that we introduced uh, back in 15.7. We were pretty much the first uh, player in the industry to come out with this application and there has been a, a lot of feedback that has come to us from many of uh, our customers over the years to improve it in terms of uh, DRC support and what I'm going to do today is provide uh, just a, a top level uh, you know, overview of this overhaul and certainly this is well deserving, deserving of its own webinar. I must also mention that we have completely rewritten the best practice paper, and this is also available on the Cadence online support site. We are introducing a uh, library flow uh, for Backdrill. This gives you the ability to define uh, the Backdrill size over here, uh, as well as the, the legend and character support, but also the, the, the Backdrill start layer pad, the solder mask pad, the clearance anti-pads, the route keepouts at the Bactrill pin and via location. So all the pads going from the start layer to the must not cut layer can be defined at the library level. Okay, so this is another migration consideration you need to take into account 
what is my plan here for backfill? Am I going to leverage the Cadence library flow or a different flow that I'll talk about in just a minute? Second, backdrill set up an analysis. This is the main form to set up your layer pairs. This can be time consuming, okay? And we're gonna help you out here. We introduced two new methods to create these layer pairs. We, we maintain the first method of using the deepest backdrill layer from top to bottom. This gives you all combinations possible, but of course, that, that's not practical. That's very expensive and probably unnecessary. So option two, option three, a control to create layer pairs based on minimizing electrical stub lengths. So this is going to drill out the hole as, as deep as possible. Or to minimize uh, layer pairs. This would be your cost efficient model. This would give you the least amount of layer pairs in the grid. You still meet the back drill stub rules, but the stubs might be a little longer than using option number two. But all this can be done in seconds. Even if you don't go to 17.2 immediately, think about using 17.2 for this purpose only. Go into the setup form and run an analysis on your 16.6 design and see what it comes back to. Okay, once you run the back drill uh, uh, application, we now uh, improve the graphics in the screen. You have the ability to see uh, the back drill locations in terms of uh, labels, just like we have with buried and blind via labels. We put a back drill label on the site. The B means back drill. The, the first number is the start layer, then the second one would be the two layer, and then the third one would be the must not cut layer. We display the route keep out on the etch layers. We display the back drill hole as an unfilled hole so it doesn't conflict with the filled hole in the middle. Um, and then, of course, the negative planes would be increased as well. Now, if the library process uh, seems a bit too much uh, for you to manage, um, we do have an alternative to that, and this would be parameter controls at the Allegro level. This would be the third tab in the setup and analysis form. This allows you to go in and type what we call overages and underages. So you're essentially typing in an overage for the back drill diameter. Add 14 mils to the pin and via holes. Uh, this might be a, a good solution, but it's not as flexible as driving it through the library. You might need different overages for vias in a, in a dense BGA field versus uh, pins on a connector, for example. Um, in a case where you dis define uh, library-based backdrill controls as well as using this uh, method, library always wins. That's the last bullet in the slide. So if you have data defined in the library pad, that will always take precedence over these parameters here. So how do I know if all the pins and vias on my design have uh, library data injected into them? You would go down here and click Details. This will give you a, a list of, uh, of pad stacks in your database that do not have user-defined back drill data on them. This is something that you might want to do in the beginning stages of your design cycle to give the library group a chance to, to enter this data in by the time you actually need to use the back drill application. Lastly, with the export of data to uh, manufacturing, uh, the IPC 2581 format does now support uh, the, the back drill uh, intent. And this is just a graphic now uh, added to the cross-section chart. We, we've added in the back drill intent. The first column would be the standard through-hole drill, but the back drill uh, would be represented by these uh, tips here on, on these drill figures. And we do add in the labels above them as to the, uh, the start layer and the two and must not cut layers. Reason number nine, uh, design rule checks. We, we try to add uh, DRCs uh, you know, in any release that we um, output, but um, this here, we now uh, introduce uh, the long awaited acute angle DRC. There's four variations of this check, line to pad, line to shape, shape edge to shape edge, line to line. Uh, we do default the angle in the constraint uh, mode form to 90 degrees, but you can set this from 1 up to 90. These are just some examples of what we're checking. Next, uh, we introduced the drill hole check uh, back uh, in 16.2 when we came out with the uh, unused pad suppression utility. We needed a hole check in place to make sure we maintain metal from the edge of the hole. The request from our users since then is we need a full-time drill check, whether the pad is present or not. 
So if you were looking to enable this behavior, you would go into the analysis modes and, and check the check holes within pad option. And this will give you the drill hole checks whether the, the pad is present or not. We introduced uh, the concept of net class to net class relationships back when we overhauled Constraint Manager in 16.0. And the method to expose the relationships is in a tree format. And it's also a bit redundant to read. The request from our users is, is, is it possible to create a two-dimensional array allowing us to see the relationships in a, in a vertical and horizontal manner? So that's what this form is. To enable it, you would go into the net class, net class folder and open the CSET assignment matrix. And you have the ability to now easily navigate to your relationship and click the uh, space and constraint set from the dropdown. Uh, reason number 10 and last for this session would be the introduction of our new uh, team design environment uh, that we call Symphony. Okay, currently uh, we do support team design, but it is an asynchronous team design uh, environment. We introduced what we call design petition and back in release 15.5. Uh, today in 17.2, we are introducing a real-time concurrent team design environment. This is a product add-on. Um, it's available now. Uh, best to probably contact your, your local account team uh, to gain access to temp keys for evaluation. Okay. This will uh, facilitate uh, multiple PCB designers working synchronously on a PCB layout. So basically the team is working together in one database. There are no partition zones or boundaries and so forth. At this present time, we do support up to 10 uh, users uh, on a local LAN. Uh, users can drop out or join anytime. Uh, the functionality that we have in place at this given time is the ability to move components and the basic uh, interactive etch editing commands, add, connect, slide, delay, tune. We do have the time and vision environment supported with auto interactive delay tuning, auto interactive phase tuning. We are aggressively working on adding features. So expect to see this uh, solution evolve through the QIRs and the, and the major releases. Okay, um, and, and last but not least, um, with 17.2, we have uh, made the database now 64-bit. Uh, so you, you should see good performance improvements uh, with, with some of the designs uh, that tend to be on the, on the large size. The database capacity has increased from 400 megabyte up to three gigabyte or so. So like I said, we have lots of reasons to migrate, not just 10, but for trying to keep the time in a 45-minute session, uh, we had to uh, minimize this. So this, this concludes uh, this uh, fast-paced uh, webinar on reasons to migrate. We'll wrap it up now uh, with um, an open line, I guess, uh, for any type of questions that may come in. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, this is uh, Jim Fry again, product manager for Allegro PCB. And I'd like very much to thank everyone's attendance today. Uh, we will be having future webinars, as you saw earlier. Uh, on this topic of 17.2 and ORCAD and Allegro strengths, and we look forward to your participation. Uh, there is a link here that we'll make sure you get uh, in your follow-up email uh, that will make it easy for you to subscribe to these additional webinars. And we also welcome your engagement and participation in our community. Uh, the new cadence.com website has a location for uh, a new series of blogs and there's a way for you to subscribe to those uh, so you get us an email when a new entry is added to that community for the PCB design blog. Thank you very much for your attendance today everyone and uh, we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar.